Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Crossroads Worship Center located at 190 Lambs Road in Sewell, New Jersey. I bear you greetings on behalf of Pastor Mike Ruggiero and Pastor Kathy Ruggiero and the entire church family here at Crossroads. This is midweek Bible study, as I said before, ladies and gentlemen, and the hope is that you will walk away better than you came in, in Jesus' name. A couple of quick announcements before we dive into our study for the evening. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, if this is the first time that you are visiting with us Wednesday night, we certainly would love the opportunity to speak with you, to fellowship with you after uh, this service is over, to give you some literature and certainly be a blessing to you. So if you are at home right now, you should see on your screen a tag with a QR code at the end that invites you to actually follow to our website and just simply share your name with us. We want to be able to welcome you more personally. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we also so want you to know that on Wednesday nights, we certainly do provide for the entire family. We provide food, spiritual food anyway, physical food, you have to do that before or after you come, but spiritual food for all the adults here in Bible study, but we also have a number of uh, other things going on on Wednesday night. We have the Royal Rangers, which are for our young men who are budding in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. And so they meet uh, in what's been dubbed the underground here at the church on Wednesday nights. And then of course we have the young ladies and girls ministry who are also being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So if you have young men, young women that you want to receive more than what they receive on Sunday, more than what they received at home, I mean, you just want them to be fully dunked in the word on a regular basis, please come on out on Wednesday nights. Last but certainly not least, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is clear that if you've been sown or you've been blessed with spiritual things, then the minister and, of course, the ministry ought to reap, quote unquote, carnal or material things. It takes a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen, to actually take the word of God here and, for, uh, here and fro, and it also takes quite a bit of money to run the ministry here. We would ask that you prayerfully consider uh, prayerfully consider giving here to the ministry at Crossroads Worship Center. Believe me, we would dare not suggest a total amount of money. However, if you've got a cool million that you're not doing anything with, we will gladly take it. Cool couple of hundred thousand. Whatever the amount you are led to give, remember it is you that is helping to make it happen. On your screen right now, you will see a tag with a QR code that will take you to our PayPal page. It is absolutely safe and secure, and you can be rest assured that the money is being used to further the kingdom of God. Well, that's all of our announcements uh, for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, other than to obviously come out and join us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Let's pray and then dive right into the word of God. Dear gracious heavenly father, we do praise and thank you for this wonderful and magnificent day that you gave us, father. It may very well have been cold. It might have very well been dim sunlight, father. But the beauty is that even in the midst of falling leaves, even in the midst of chilling cold, we know that the earth, we know that the world around us is still kept in order. And we're so thankful, Father. We're thankful that we see your imagination, your creativity writ in nature. As we drive along, Father, we thank you for the brilliant colors that you've painted on each and every leaf that falls from the tree. We're thankful, Father, for the crisp, cold air that rushes through our lungs. We're thankful, Father, for all of these things. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you that above all else, you are God. We're thankful that we are not. We thank you, Father, that even though our ancestor 
In Adam fell, you provided a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you've said in your word that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful, Father, to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, right now, we approach your throne room of grace with confession on our lips, Father. If we have said or done anything that was not pleasing in your sight, Father, we would ask, Father, that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Take a coal and cleanse our lips. Purge our hearts, Father, and take every residue of sin and throw it into the sea of forgetfulness where it is not remembered by you or by us. We thank you, Father, for it. You told us, Father, to pray for the leadership of our nation, that it may be well with us. Therefore, Father, we lift up before you tonight, President Biden. We lift up before you, Vice President Harris. We lift up before you, Father, all nine members of the Supreme Court and all 535 members of Congress, Father. We praise and we thank you that tonight, tomorrow, and for the rest of their career and term, they will be surrounded about by godly and wise men and women who would instruct them, counsel them, lead them, and guide them in the way that they should go so that we here in the United States may live peaceably in all godliness and honesty. Heavenly Father, we praise and we thank you that each and every one of them who are not saved, that you will send across their path, Father, the planter, the sower, who will plant a seed that you will send across someone that will water the seed, and then we shall see it come to fruition, Father, not only in their lives, but in the policies they support. Heavenly Father, we praise and we thank you for the local body here at Crossroads Worship Center. We thank you that in Jesus' name, we are growing by leaps, by bounds, and by births, Father, that those who are going out into the field and planting and watering, that they will see the harvest that is reaped, Father, and that it will be here, that those new babes in Christ will come and join and be fed. We lift up before you, Father, Pastor Mike Ruggiero. We lift up before you, Father, the entire minister ministerial staff here at Crossroads Worship Center. Father, bless them from the top of their heads to the tip of their toes. Bless them, Father, coming in and going out. Bless them for the work that you have assigned to them, Father. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for this. Now then, Heavenly Father, I covenant with you to speak as of the oracles of God that you would do as the psalmist of old said, Father, and make my tongue as that of a pen of a ready writer. That I would speak a good word in due season, Father, and the words that I speak would be as golden apples unto the hearer. As John the Baptist said to your son, Father, I right now decrease as you increase. I thank you, Father, in advance for truth deposits, grace impartations, and divine revelation, all by the working of the Spirit of the living God. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for it. World without end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure and privilege of leading you through Bible study this week and for the next couple of weeks. And what I'm going to be focused on, ladies and gentlemen, is the Family Matters series, right? You all probably remember that wonderfully annoying show from the 90s starring Jaleel White who wasn't initially the star of the show but became the star of the show through his presentation as Urkel and then of course Urkel as he became suave but the show focused on the Winslow family and every Friday because it was a show a staple of TGIF on ABC Every week you tuned in to see the antics of the Winslow children, of Carl Winslow, of Harriet, and so forth and so on. And one thing that you always walked away from, which is true about just about every family-oriented television show, is the fact that they suffer through bouts and waves of dysfunction, right? So some of the best episodes of family television typically involve a breakdown in the marriage that within 30 minutes is going to be repaired. The children have done something horrible that in 30 minutes will be set right. You walk away believing that everything is great in the family. And of course, where you know that that simply, that, that is, ladies and gentlemen, a work of fiction. In real life, 
The maintenance of the family is an ongoing affair. Forget one half hour. It is every second and every minute of the day. And the unfortunate thing for us is that the devil has absolutely no clock on his work. From sunup to sundown, he and his cohorts are constantly scheming, plotting the destruction of the family. Now, lest you believe that that is what I am going to focus on, let me give you a different direction. Over the next couple of weeks, beginning tonight, I'm actually going to be focusing on the spiritual family. The spiritual family. And like all those great sitcoms, we're going to start with the marriage. And you may say to yourself, well, what in the world is a spiritual marriage? We're going to learn what that is this evening very quickly. And then we are going to begin, ladies and gentlemen, to diagnose the reasons why there are problems in these spiritual marriages. I've entitled tonight, Family Matters Series, Part 1, Couples Counseling. And I put the couples in quotes for a reason that you're about to see. All throughout the Bible, you will note that the writers constantly analogize the relationship between God and man, God and a nation, God and the church, using a number of models. Paul, for instance, likens the relationship we have to God in a parental fashion. He says that God is our father, we are the children. We see this in Romans 8.15, where it says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. So we've got one, got one paradigm through which we can view the relationship between God and man. The second we see actually comes from Paul again. He likens the relationship between God and man to a master-servant relationship. 1 Corinthians 7.22, this is out of the New Living Translation. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave or servant of Christ. But the particular model or paradigm on which I would like to focus this evening came from God. This is straight out of the horse's mouth. I don't mean to call the Lord a horse, but you know the saying. It comes straight from God himself. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, the paradigm of marriage. God likens his relationship to you. He likens his relationship to the church as if he were the husband and you are the bride and you probably say to yourself I, i've never heard that before good good so this will all be continuing with the television sitcom theme as they said on nbc during the 90s it's all new to you right that was that whole campaign during the summer periods you know you saw these shows again but if you've never seen them during the regular season it's all new to you turn with me in your bibles to isaiah 54 and 5. isaiah 54 and 5 it says for your maker is your husband the lord almighty is his name the holy one of israel is your redeemer he is called the God of all the earth. In Ezekiel chapter 16, the Lord goes through this. He's speaking through the prophet Ezekiel. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is not slack concerning description. He gets very, very descriptive. He likens Israel through the birthing process as you were covered in blood. And I wiped you off. I cleaned you up. Then he said, you went through puberty. 
And I was there for all your growing pains. Don't believe me? Read Ezekiel 16. The Lord is very descriptive, right? He's a great writer. But then you drop down 16 verse 8. It says, later I passed, Ezekiel 16 verse 8. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Now, ladies and gentlemen, not to get too deep into Jewish history or to Jewish custom and practice, but we know that a husband provides the covering for his wife. That's the responsibility. It doesn't mean that she's physically naked. It simply means that when they enter into covenant, he is the covering for him, for her. His authority, his leadership, right? All of that is a covering, and God likens us to that particular circumstance. So then, ladies and gentlemen, when we take a look at Jeremiah 31, 32, we see further confirmation of it. It says in Jeremiah 31, 32, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them declares the Lord. Now, obviously, God's choice to declare himself husband to us seems odd, but when you consider that marriage is nothing more than a reflection of the nature of God, it makes all the sense in the world. It should be fairly obvious from the story of Adam and Eve that God is one of intimacy, of close fellowship. The Bible says that when he created Adam on a daily basis, God would come down from heaven and walk with his creation throughout the world. Notice it didn't say just in a small spot. It said throughout the garden. He would just walk with them. God enjoyed the fellowship. We see this in the relationship between God and Enoch. Enoch was just so righteous in the sight of God. At a certain point, the Lord said, I, I, look, I'm tired of coming down to the earth. You're, just going, you're coming home with me. And when he saw Adam, and, and believe me, God would never give you something that you didn't need. He saw in Adam a need for companionship. He saw in Adam a need for intimacy, a desire for intimacy, and so he created Eve. Eve would complement God's work in Adam's life. It would complement his companionship, his intimacy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have had that Romans 10, 9, and 10 experience where you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believed in your heart that he, raised, that he was raised from the dead, if you have now had that experience, God has provided you with the companionship of who? Of Christ Jesus, and you are now wedded to the Lord. But as is often the case, Things begin to fall apart in marriages. If you see it in natural marriages, you better believe they can happen in supernatural marriages. Tonight, I want to take a look at the top causes of the decay of spiritual marriage and why, or rather how, to avoid or to turn away from them. That's what we're going to do tonight. According to the trade journals in the area of law known as matrimonial law, an area of law in which I, and I say this honestly, unfortunately practice, and I say it's unfortunate because you hate to be the individual who is in court 
working toward what? The ending of a marriage, but it's essential. So it's unfortunate, but it's essential, right? I can tell you that we discuss these particular reasons for divorce all the time. Some of the reasons shift depending on the generation, but they all hover around the same five. And if they can plague a natural marriage, guess what? A natural marriage being reflective of the relationship between God and man, they can plague a spiritual marriage. The marriage between you and God. What are the top five? According to the stats, the number one reason for divorce in 2020, and it looks like it will be the number one reason in 2021, you wouldn't think that was possible with everyone being shut in, but the number one is infidelity, adultery, Adultery, number one reason for divorce in 2020 and 2021. Number two, second most cited reason, lack of intimacy. Again, shocking in 20, 2020 and 2021. You're not going out anywhere. I don't know what in the world you were doing. Who were you talking to? You were at home with your, you were at home with your family, your spouse. If you didn't know them, on that kind of a grip, maybe, well, maybe that's the problem. You got to know him too well, right? Now it's over. I got, I got to go, right? Number three, lack of communication. Number four, money, financial woes. And number five, addictions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at how all those five apply to a spiritual message, right? Before we get there, though, I have some principles. There are three. There are three principles. Three principles about a spiritual marriage that differ from a natural marriage. Number one, and I know pastor is going to love this one. Number one, right? Any breakdown in your relationship with God is your fault. That one should be fairly obvious. Any breakdown in your relationship with God is your fault, not God's. So if you come to pastor and say, pastor, I think the Lord is doing me dirty. Pastor is simply going to tell them, you're wrong. In every other relationship, pastor will likely say to you, there are two sides to every story. I need to hear from the other person. In this particular relationship, pastor has it on good authority that the other person is completely faultless. It will always be you. That's principle number one. Whenever there is a breakdown in your relationship with God, it is always you. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, what? I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. So if that is the promise of God, every aspect of breakdown in your relationship with the Father is totally due to your actions. He will not have done anything. Second principle, repentance and reconciliation is the first step in repairing your relationship with God. Repentance and reconciliation is the first step in repairing your relationship with God. 1 John 1 and 9, we quote this one all the time. You heard me say this when we were in prayer. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Third principle, and this one is probably the saddest, but it's the most profound of all the principles. The third principle is divorce from God is certain death. Divorce from God is certain death death. I'm going to say it one last time. 
Divorce from God is certain death. It is not probable. It is not maybe. It is death. In the natural, when a divorce happens in a legal marriage, presumably both parties go on. They may get remarried, but they're going to go, hopefully go on to lead their best lives. In the relationship between God and man at the point of divorce, there is only death. Let's take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. The writer of Hebrews said it is impossible for those who have the knowledge of the goodness of God you have been in relationship with God. You know how good he is. He's been better to you than you've ever been to yourself. And you walk away from him. The writer of Hebrews said, it is impossible for them to come back to repentance. Peter tells us the same thing in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. He says, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. That is so profound. Peter is literally saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you choose the way of the world, having come out of that corrupt system and now experience the liberty of Christ, if you choose to be entangled in that corruption again, Peter tells us it's worse for you on the end than when you first came to Christ. It is worse on the end than it was when you first married. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Over the past year, two years, three years, I am sure many of you have unfortunately been absolutely pained when you open up a charisma magazine excuse me when you open up a charisma magazine you open up a christian post and there is yet another story splashed in headlines about a praise and worship leader a minister an evangelist a missionary that had been on fire for god whose music whose sermons you have memorized right only to have them say i i, I just don't know if god exists anymore I, 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 I got to walk away. I don't even believe there is a God anymore. How? How in the world could you stand before the world in heartfelt worship like you did all of those years? How? How could you preach from pulpits around the globe for decades and now come to a place where you could honestly say, I, I, I just don't know if he exists anymore. And the saddest part about it is when you ask, when you read what their reasons are for it, you go to yourself, well, you know, that's just crap, right? Tell us what it really is. Tell us what the real real is. Because you and I both know that it wasn't just you. You woke up one day and I didn't feel the Lord. And that's the worst one of them all because the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So what in the world your feelings have to do with anything is completely beyond me. The Lord never told you, oh, touch and see that I'm good. He said, oh, taste and see. So you on the wrong sense to begin with. But then, ladies and gentlemen, what the Lord 
revealed to me is it's one of these five. They may not ever say it to you, but it's one of these five. Some of those same ministers, if you follow them around to now, or former ministers, if you follow them around now, you'll figure out which one of the five it is, if not a combination of them, if not all of them. But that is exactly what we're talking about. The first major fault in a relationship with God that leads to breakdown, ladies and gentlemen, is spiritual adultery or infidelity. Spiritual adultery or infidelity. One thing you should know about God is he says it throughout his entire word. He says, I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. I'm not going to have any gods before me. There won't be any work. And what does it mean? We sing that song here on, on Sunday. You hear it on the radio, right? We, he is jealous for me, right? Right? He's jealous for me. It means that he is deeply passionate and cares for you. It doesn't mean that he's that jealous ex. You know, well, well, well why, do you, why did you talk about Buddha today? That's not God. Well, well you, you know, you, you kind of gave that Sikh temple a, a second look today. I'm, you know, I don't know how I feel about, I don't know how I feel about that. You, you were speaking Arabic. You, are you, uh, are you, uh, you seeing Muhammad for a, a date? I mean, what's going on? That's not the jealousy God is talking about. God is confident that there is no other God that can outdo what he does. And when he shares all his love and care for you, but you essentially decide, I want a lesser God. That's spiritual infidelity. No, Lord, I... Lord, I'm not leaving you. I just, I just, I, it was just a date. It was just a, it was just a date with Baha'ism. I, I want to, I want to take the principles, just, just the principles of Hinduism and fuse them with Christianity. I think it'll make my faith that much stronger. If God is complete, total, and whole in your life, there's no room for any other melding. You understand? But in Jeremiah 3.20, the Lord talks about it. He said, but like a woman faithless to her lover, even so you have been faithless to me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. You know, the Lord was coming at Israel regularly. I mean, just dropping it. He said, you were like a faithless woman. I give you all of these things. I wine you. I dine you. I bring you. I put you in a house. I do all of these things, right? And you turn to these false idols. I rain manna down from heaven. I give you quail to eat. I place a cloud over your head while you're marching through the desert in the heat. I make it warm at night when it's all too cold. I part the Red Sea for you to walk through. I kill off all your enemies. I give you a place that is swarming. Or not swarming, but it's flowing with milk and honey. Right? Just as an aside, I always, I always thought that that was the inspiration for Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, that's the only musical I really loved growing up, that in the whiz, because I always wanted to be one of the children who got to go in Willy Wonka's, you know, they would have thrown me out in the first five minutes because I would have broke every rule eating things that I'm not supposed to eat, but it would have been the best five minutes of my life. And so the milk and honey part, I always said, wow, so this land was like a Werther's chocolate, like a Werther's candy factory, you know, you're just milking it, but I now get it, I now get it, that there, that there was so much fruit and so much pasture land full of cows that it just, I mean, there was just milk and honey everywhere. I mean, just bees everywhere. The Lord said, I gave you all of that, and you still treat me like you do. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus' brother lays it out in just, I mean, th this is so beautiful. James tells us exactly what spiritual infidelity is. Spiritual adultery is. James chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. And I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible. This is what James said 
is actual spiritual infidelity. This, when you see Christians falling away from God, I guarantee you, examine their life. James 4, 4 through 5, lays it out. It says, you are cheating on God. That's how the Message Bible said it. I didn't say that. I mean, did you see how beautiful it, it lays it out? James said, you are cheating on God if all you want is your own way. Flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he is a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. James just told us, ladies and gentlemen, that the root of all spiritual infidelity is selfishness. When the only thing that you are more concerned with is what you want, how I feel, what I need. You no longer want the ways of God. You no longer want the things of God. You want the things of the world because your flesh, what you want, is more important. That's the root of spiritual infidelity. So if in your relationship, your Christian walk, you are finding yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, falling through, check your motives and intent. Check your heart. Is it God and his work at the center or is it you? If when you pray, are you praying more for what you want or are you praying more in thanksgiving? Is your prayer 90% give me, 10% God, or is it the reverse? Romans 8, 7 through 8 says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You wonder why your relationship is falling apart? Because you can't even please the Lord. You're that carnally minded. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17 in the Message Bible, it says, don't love the world's ways, don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. The person who commits spiritual infidelity, ladies and gentlemen, is the one who professes to be a Christian, yet finds his real love and pleasure in the things that Satan offers. I want to say that again. The person who commits spiritual infidelity is one who professes to be a Christian yet finds his or her real love and pleasure in the things that Satan offers. So you come and you tell everybody that you're a Christian, but the things that delight you most in the world have nothing to do with God. They're things. Number two, lack of intimacy. It's a big one. If you truly, no matter what relationship it is, it could be a marriage, it could be a friendship, it could be a sibling. How many of you can honestly say, I know what my wife is thinking without her even saying it? I can look at her face. I know when she's hungry. I know when she's angry. I know when she's happy. I know when she wants me to shut up, right? I can tell it all just by looking at her face. She doesn't have to say anything, right? Your friends can do the same thing. Your siblings can do the same thing. It is the result of intimacy. It is the result of having spent time with you so often that now you can pick up on cues without it even being said. Nothing need be spoken. You can see it, and their face says it all.
Marriages fall apart due to that lack of intimacy. The failure, the, the lack of a desire to get to know one another. The same thing happens to God. We are enriched by his word. And the failure to cultivate time with the Lord is the demise of your relationship. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to, to them and make our home with them. 1 Corinthians 1 through 9, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship. Koinonia, with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Fellowship. God created Eve for the express purpose of giving companionship to Adam. He said it's not good that man dwell alone. He created each of us to be social creatures. We crave intimacy with one another, but in a spiritual sense, we are supposed to crave what? We are supposed to crave intimacy with the Father. Here is the surest way to know. If you want your relationship to God to be like your relationship to a spouse, your relationship to a parent, one of the surefire is to have a conversation with God. Well, how do I do that? Well, Julie, well, how do I do that without looking crazy? Because I don't want to be walking through coals on Black Friday and just look crazy when I start asking the, you know, how do I do it? Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. He doesn't mean literally. You can't balance the Bible. Well, I, my lips are big enough. But, but the, the average person is not going to be able to balance the Bible on their lips. What does he mean? He means to continue speaking the word. And the only way that you speak the word is because you are knowledgeable of the word. The only way that you're knowledgeable of the word is because you are reading and studying to show thyself approved. Joshua says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do you know Joshua 1.8 is the only where, it's the only place I believe the stat is it's the only place in the entire Bible where you'll find that successful. It's either the whole Bible or the Old Testament. It's either one. You, it's the only place you'll hear successful. And the Lord specifically tells Joshua to tell the people that success comes expressly through meditating on my word day and night. Now, for Bible junkies like me, the wonderful thing that I get from the Word of God is that every single time I study it, I get something new. These fresh revelations. The moment that you crack open the Word of God and it no longer excites you, check the flame. Check the flame in your heart. It should. There's a problem. Just like in your marriage, just like in your relationships, if they're stale, when you meet each other, if you don't light up, if, the, if your babies don't jump the way that Jesus and John did when they came into contact with one another in the womb, if that isn't happening, check the flame in your heart. It's not God. He's still there. It's you. The oil is low. The candle wick is short. Check your oil. Check your wick. Check your fire. The intimacy of God, studying his word, should excite you. Jeremiah said so beautifully, he said, I wanted to walk away. I wanted to, he said, but it felt like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't help but to speak. That's how it should be every time around the word of God. Next up, lack of communication. This one should be fairly easy to understand how this causes a breakdown. You don't talk to God in prayer. What are you going to do? This is fairly obvious. You don't talk to each other. Like, Lord, I'm taking off my spiritual ring. You didn't just disappoint me, right? We're not talking anymore. You didn't put God on the proverbial couch. We're not talking, right? Now, I'm bad with it. The Lord, I declare, I talk to the Lord so often during the day. I know in heaven he tells me on a regular basis to shut up. 
I talk his ear off. I do. And I'm not, I don't give a care. I was, look, I was walking through ShopRite today having a conversation with the Lord. I, I was. I was talking to the Lord about what I wanted to prepare and things like that. I don't care. People were looking at me. You know, now that we live in the Bluetooth age, most people probably presume I'm on the telephone. But I've been doing this since I was in high school. I just walk around talking to the Lord. I figure, why wouldn't the Lord want to know that I, what I want to put in my suit? This afternoon, why wouldn't the Lord want to know what I want to paint my kitchen with? I saw this, I saw this, um, this head of cauliflower, and it was purple and green, and it was just this beautiful color scheme on this head of cauliflower. And I told the Lord, you know what? That would be perfect, Lord. For now, that'd be perfect in my house. Now, most people would sit there and go, why in the world? Why do you think the Lord would want to know about that? Well, why wouldn't he? And that's all prayer is, is a conversation to God. It increases your intimacy with him to have these conversations. The problem with me is that I'm always talking. The Lord is working on me with listening. Because sometimes he's like, look, I know you want to talk about the cauliflower, but I want to talk to you about a student of yours. You see? So, if you remember, ladies and gentlemen, I said to you that prayer is the communication to God, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. I'm not going to read it, but you know that that's the Lord's prayer. The Lord told you specifically, don't recite the prayer. The Lord said, pray in this way. And we talked about this, acts, right, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and of course, supplication. In other words, adore the Lord, lavish praise on him because he's worthy of it. Not because he demands it, but because he is your what? He is your God and he's proven himself worthy of it. Confess your sins. Thank the Lord for what he's done and then ask the Lord what you want. If you follow that order, you will be in perfect harmony with what Jesus Christ said, where he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. So with supplication last, ladies and gentlemen, and everything first, you have prepared your heart to seek the Lord first so that those things you've prayed for will be added unto you. Right? That's why Jesus told you to pray in that way, because it literally starts you on that path. I told you about the informal communication. I just talk to God all day. I sit in my car. I'm driving along to work, driving to the courthouse, driving up to school, driving, and I just have conversations with the Lord. I said, Lord, I, you know, Lord, I really just didn't like that. I didn't like that ending to that movie. The Lord didn't watch the movie, but I'm telling him, right? And I don't have to give the Lord spoiler alerts. That's the beautiful thing about talking to an omnipotent being. I don't have to give him spoiler alerts, right? I don't have to give the Lord trigger warnings. None of those things. I can just talk to him all the time. Lord, I didn't like the end of that movie. I didn't like the end of that movie. Sometimes the Lord says back, he goes, that's why I told you not to watch it, right? Now you out seven, eight dollars because you went and watched garbage, right? I told you not to do it, right? That hesitancy was me. The Lord did that with me, not with this past ghost, but not with this Ghostbusters movie in the theater, but the one before then. The Lord told me, don't go. I followed the Lord's leading and I was blessed. I was blessed of the Lord not to have gone. Hallelujah, right? And then, of course, ladies and gentlemen, the other reason why is because you don't speak the language of God. There are love languages. You've read these before, the five love languages. God has a preferred language. His language is that of service. James 1, 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows, there's the service, in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The best example of it, ladies and gentlemen, comes from John chapter 21, 15 through 17. You know this one quite well. This is the redemption of Peter. Peter is sitting there, God is sitting there, you, you know, they're all eating. They finished eating, and <laughs> the Lord loved Peter, Lord. He, he was, he, Lord, you, you truly do. You truly loved him. Jesus turned to Peter, and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me 
more than these? And, and Peter said, yes, yes, Lord, I, you, know, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said then, feed my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was now hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, and you know Jesus wouldn't care about Peter's feelings. Peter, you know, Peter was really mercurial in that way, right? I have a mission for you, Peter. Do you love me, he said. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus then finally says, Peter, then feed my sheep. God was trying to communicate to Peter that the expression of love for me is in your service to others. If your marriage or relationship to God is faltering, ladies and gentlemen, you need to check the degree of service you are putting in for the ministry, for the kingdom of God. I don't mean just here at Crossroads. See, that one, that one is pretty easy. You can join a ministry here, do all of that. We're talking about out in the world where Christ said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good deeds, your works, and praise God in heaven. The reason why God seems to be silent to you in your relationship to him is because you aren't speaking his language. Your service unto God is slim to nil. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes. He said, then here's how you show it. Feed my sheep. Make your service unto the kingdom of God. Fourth, money issues. Now, many of you are going to say, well, how does that one work? How is a money issue with God? It's what money represents, ladies and gentlemen. Money represents insecurity, or the lack of it represents insecurity. When we don't have it, we feel as though we're about to suffer. We're going to fall. Philippians 4, 6, however, tells us what? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. There are no money issues in the life of the believer. David said, I've been young, yet now I am old, and I've never seen this one thing. I've never seen the children of God begging bread, nor his children in lack. In fact, Jesus goes on, Matthew 6, 26 through 30. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And I know that firsthand because there are a couple of jokers that are in my winter plants. And we, yeah, yeah, the Lord is feeding them all right. And I may have to, may, the Lord not going to talk about that one too. Are you not much more valuable than they are? And you are. You are. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties your cares, your fears, your insecurities on him because he cares for you. Our insecurities drive us away from the Lord and wreck our marriage to him, our relationship with him. Because we are so anxious, because we are so concerned, and then when we think God has not come through, we sit there and we throw it all. No, I'm done. I've had enough. I've loved you, Lord. I served you, Lord. We're intimate. I read your word. I pray every day. And now I'm facing eviction and you haven't done anything. I'm facing foreclosure. You've done nothing. I don't have a job. I can't feed myself, let alone my children. I can't do any of this. And all of a sudden in that fit of anxiousness, and I've been there, God knows I'm preaching to myself more than I am anybody else. This is my therapy session. I've been there. 
But don't throw away the care and concern. Don't forget that he loves you. Every bird that you see flying, every field of flowers you see bending in the wind should be confirmation to you that if God is making all of that happen, he's going to take care of you much more so. Money ain't a thing. Last but certainly not least, ladies and gentlemen, it's addiction. In real life, we know we're talking about sometimes a chemical addiction. Other times, ladies and gentlemen, it's just nothing more than an activity that addicts us, whether it's gambling, it could be television, it could be sexual in nature, it could be any of those things. But one thing we do know is that addiction has as its definition this, that it is a strong and unwavering desire for a thing that just will not stop. What does that sound like to you? In the Bible, we didn't call that addiction. We called it lust. Lust will drive you away from the Lord. When your fleshly desires take more precedent or more time than your devotion. Romans 12, 1 through 2. We're going to finish up around here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Addictions are by their nature selfish, they focus and train the mind on the immediate, and the person is moved to do only what feels good or what they want in the moment. That's why in Titus 1.16, Paul talking to Titus, he said, he said, they claim to know God, but their actions, but in their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved, some translations say reprobate mind, so that they do what ought not be done. Ladies and gentlemen, our addictions to things, our lust for the gratifications of the flesh, squeeze God out and center our needs and wants in our lives. So tonight, go through your relationship. If things seem dim, if it seems dull, if the spark with God is no longer there, the flint of the word doesn't seem to catch, ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, am I still faithful to the Lord? Am I intimate with the Lord? Am I communing or communicating with the Lord? Have my insecurities driven me from God? And have my lust, my addiction to worldly things, as it squeezed God out? That's where we will end this evening. Next week is fun. Because we're going to take a look at our relationship brother to brother, sister to sister. How we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we endeavor to ask that wonderfully inevitable question. Can't we just kill them all and tell God they died? We're going to answer that question next week. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we do praise and thank you for this wonderful time around the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you've said for us to bind the word of God to our hearts that we might not sin against you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this word is sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces asunder, Father, 
even to the marrow of our bones. You search us, Father, with this word. You know our hearts. Reveal for us, Father, where we are lacking with your word. And Heavenly Father, if at all possible, gently restore us to where we ought to be. Heavenly Father, we praise and we thank you. Mm. We thank and praise you, Father, for the promise of God. Right now, I stretch my hands forth and pronounce a blessing over everyone who is listening, that everyone is blessed coming in and going out, that they know that they are above only and not beneath, that they are the head and not the tail. Heavenly Father, that they are blessed from the crown of their heads to the tip of their toes. We pray, Father, that the safety of the Lord goes before each person as they go home and travels with them to their jobs. We thank you, Father, for prosperity in every aspect of their lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope to see you here Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Pastor Mike will be right back here in the pulpit. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, be blessed and continue to be a blessing. Good night.